Well, welcome to all who are here this afternoon to join in the praise of our God together. It's always a blessing to be able to gather and to gather twice. It is a privilege, so may we praise the Lord together. We'll begin with a song of approach. We'll stand and we'll sing number 425, stanzas 1, 3, 5, and 6. Congregation, we'll have the call to worship. It'll come from Psalm 100, and afterwards, we will have a time of silent prayer, and then it will lead into number 558. Hear the Lord's call to worship. Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. We confess our dependence is upon the Lord. Congregation, from where does your help come? Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. 
Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us sing a song of approach, number 95A, stanzas one and three. We'll join in confessing our faith together. This afternoon we do so with the words of the Apostles' Creed. We'll say it in unison, and you'll find it on page 851 of the Trinity Psalter hymnal. The Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. A sing. A song of praise, we'll sing number 216.
This afternoon, in your reading of Scripture, as you've been systematically working through, you come to Psalm 40, and so that is what we will also read now. Psalm 40, and the title there is, To the Choir Master, a Psalm of David. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry bog and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after a lie. You have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts toward us. None can compare with you. I will proclaim and tell of them, yet they are more than can be told. In sacrifice and offering, you have not delighted but you have given me an open ear. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I said, behold, I have come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. I have told the glad news of deliverance in the great congregation. Behold, I have not restrained my lips. As you know, O Lord, I have not hidden your deliverance within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your steadfast love and your faithfulness from the great congregation. As for you, O Lord, you will not restrain your mercy from me. Your steadfast love and your faithfulness will will ever preserve me. For evils have encompassed me beyond number. My iniquities have overtaken me, and I cannot see. They are more than the hairs of my head. My heart fails me. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Let those be put to shame and disappointed altogether who seek to snatch away my life. Let those be turned back and brought to dishonor who delight in my hurt. Let those be appalled because of their shame who say to me, aha, aha. But may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say continually, Great is the Lord. As for me, I am poor and needy, but the Lord takes thought for me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, O my God. Thus far, the word of our God. Let us have our congregational prayer and come before this Lord. O oh God, it is a wonderful thing for us to bow our heads, to gather here, and to pour out our hearts before you, the longings that we have, the desire to see your kingdom grow, to see the name of Jesus spread from pole to pole, from east to west, to see sons and daughters coming to faith, seeing that their only hope will be found in Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And so as we come here this afternoon, we do ask that you would continue to extend your kingdom, that you would be working in our lives, giving us opportunity to speak of the hope that we have, to speak of the salvation that we found, not in ourselves, but in the matchless Savior, that our lives would in every way shine forth the light and the radiance of Jesus Christ, that we who have been saved from so much would be given the courage to be quick to speak, to to be quick to, to point not to ourselves, but to you, to our God who is faithful and just, who who is growing your kingdom all at all times and all places. 
We pray for the mission work of your church, for missionaries who are serving in faraway fields, who are perhaps lonely, who are perhaps weary of striving on and on. May you give them encouragement in their work. May they know that their work is not in vain, that where your word goes forth, it goes forth with power. May you give them faithfulness, that when they labor where no other eyes may see, where there's less accountability, they may still do so with such an awareness that they are there to serve you, that it would be the longing of their heart to see souls brought from death to life. Lord, you work in this world. We see it. We see it in the hardest of places. We see it in countries where there has been every attempt to try and suppress the gospel. We see it in communist countries. We see it even in our own country where there's just a, a complacency. And yet, there are faithful churches gathering. There are lives being transformed minds being renewed, your word going forth, and we rejoice in that work. We rejoice to know that your kingdom is growing. And may that continue to be the case. May you bless the work of, of the missionaries, the, the funds that we send to them, the, the prayers that we offer for them, that as you hear them, Lord, as you, you provide for their needs, you would be working mighty works all throughout this world. We pray for the persecuted church. We do think of those countries like China or North Korea, places like India or Iran, Afghanistan, and so many others where being a Christian is a dangerous thing, where the idea of simply walking off to church and praising you is something that could cost their lives. May you encourage our brothers and sisters that they would not become afraid, but that they would count the cost and count it worth it in every way. That you would encourage them in their walk with you. That you would encourage them in the opportunities that you give and that you would be gracious to them. That they would not have to live under such a fear of their lives being taken at any moment. Lord, you love your people wherever they are. And we know that you are with them. But may they know that reality too. And may it comfort them in whatever their persecution or their distress. Father, we pray also for our own government. We thank you that you've put us in a land that is governed. That it is not all wildness and waste. But that you have put structures in place. You've given us a prime minister and other ministers. You've given us a municipal government, a provincial government, and all down the line. And though it is often a government we may not appreciate, there are things we do not agree with there. You have, even in giving us this government, given us so much more than we deserve. You've shown us grace and kindness in the way in which we are able to gather here and how there is still so much freedom for us. And we ask where there is a hardness of heart and a blindness, that you who are able to break through the hardest of hearts and able to open the eyes of, of the most lost sinner would be at work, that you would be opening eyes to see that this is your world, that our Prime Minister Justin Trudeau would see and be able to acknowledge that whoever he was, he does not need to be that person anymore, but that he may serve before you as your servant. We would love for that to happen, but if it is not your will, then may you give us peace, may you give us wisdom and a knowledge to know how to live within the government and the situation that you have given to us. O oh Lord, bless our nation. Keep us strong and free, but more than anything, turn back the tide and bring us to a point where we recognize as a nation that we are under your sovereignty, that you are our God, that the way of life will be found in the way that you have put before us. Open eyes, turn hearts, 
Grant us joy. And may we praise you as a nation before you. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. This afternoon, as we have the opportunity to give of the gifts that God has given to us, when the deacons come forward, we're taking the collection for the Right to Life ministry, uh, probably something many of you are familiar with. I'm not a spokesman, but Right to Life at the earliest stages, at the end of life as well. And so that is our collection this afternoon. What else that you would rise, we'll sing uh, 42B, um, and our text for today will be Psalm 42 as well. And this, sorry, we'll, we'll sing stanzas 1, 5, and 8.
Our scripture reading and our text are one and the same, and so this afternoon we'll be looking at Psalm 42. Psalm 42, the title there, To the Choir Master, a Mesquil of the Sons of Korah. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night. Well, they say to me all the day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God, with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude keeping festival. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. My soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon, from Mount Miser. Deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have gone over me. By day, the Lord commands his steadfast love. And at night his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me, while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? Why? Are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Thus far, the word of the Lord. You may find it helpful to keep your Bibles open as we go through the psalm. Congregation, have you ever had a full year of your life where everything went exactly the way that you had hoped? Exactly as you had planned that it would, not a single hiccup, no sick days, no injuries, no unexpected expenses. In a full year, yes, I'm being ridiculous. That would be incredible. So how about a month? Maybe a week? And again, no. More likely a day, maybe a few hours is the maximum. Now we know that sometimes the things that come up, they're really not a big deal. Maybe this happened to you today. If you're out on a a Sunday stroll and, and your kid decides to jump into a puddle, well, that could be a bit inconvenient. It's not the end of the world, inconvenient. What if you woke up tomorrow and your car was just simply gone? Or the dentist says that all of your kids are going to need braces at exactly the same time. Well, okay, we've got a bit more of a problem all of a sudden. But what about when the tests come back and the doctor, he sits you down and he tells you that you have cancer? Or you receive the unexpected news that someone you love has been taken home in a car crash? Where your world, it reels Everything changes, and you find yourself, you're gasping, trying to find a place to plant your feet. But where do we go when providence seems harsh, when God seems far away, and all we have are questions? And that question in itself is not a question unique to our age. In the book of Psalms, God has given us a prayer book and a psalter to meet us in our every need. We find there the full spectrum of human emotion, 
Saints respond to their varied circumstances. So we see that there are psalms that exude the height of joy. You have the cymbals clashing, you've got the dancing, you've got the whirling around. Everyone's rejoicing over the goodness of God. But then we see the other extreme, where the soul is racked with questions and pain slips unguarded from the lips of the saints. And in these psalms, we see the honest emotion of the human soul bared before its maker, asking questions, why? Where are you, Lord? Well, in Psalm 42, we come to one of those psalms. It's a psalm about a saint in a time of deep questioning. He's deeply troubled because the hand of providence that he has been dealt looks very bad, and God seems distant. Circumstances of hardship, they're gonna pile up one after another. As we'll see, the imagery that he's going to use is gripping. The emotional weight that he feels is intense. It's really quite raw. It's the wrestling of his flesh, eyeing its circumstances despairingly, and faith, which knows that it has not been deceived. That the promises of God to us never fail that even if the psalmist feels utterly abandoned, that it's just that, it's, it's a feeling. And so I hope, and it's my prayer, that as we move through this psalm, you'll see that this is a psalm that we can all relate to. It's a psalm for the Christian today, for those of us who know where our true hope lies, in the person of Jesus Christ alone. For the believer, this is a psalm that you can take on your own lips. You may do so with confidence that no matter what in God's providence is laid before you, no matter how far God feels in those moments of despair or depression, that he has not abandoned your soul. That your questioning and your deepest longing after him is never misplaced. And so I want to look at this psalm in four sections. First, in the first four verses, we're going to see a saint's confession. And secondly, in verse five, we're going to see a saint's self-counsel. And thirdly, verses six to 10, we see a saint's confidence. And then in the last verse, verse 11, we'll see a saint's comfort. So in the first place, then, let's start with a saint's confession. And to begin, Context can be helpful. We might ask the question, well, who is this psalmist? And if you look at the title above our psalm, it says, To the Choir Master, a Mesquil of the Sons of Korah. And throughout church history, there have been many solid, solid men who have made the argument that this is likely a psalm written by King David and then given into the care of the sons of Korah. And the arguments, they're very interesting. If you want to pick up a commentary, you'll find them all go down that road, if, if that's the thing you want to look at. But in this case, where scripture does not explicitly name David as our author, we don't need to get stuck here, and so we're gonna kind of run past that. Whoever this psalmist is, what matters is that through them, the Holy Spirit has given us this psalm. And so we have here a psalm for the lips of those who in faith are wrestling with hardship. And it's a psalm that all of us can learn from. So, to our Bibles then. Verse 1, it begins with vivid imagery. It says there, as a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. The image is of a deer that's pursued. The chase has been long. Here's a desperate creature. It's tired. It's, it's longing with animal instinct for a break from the chase to drink or it will die. And the psalmist, he's saying that the longing of his soul, it's like that deer's desperate longing. He's just hanging on, but how much longer can he go? Maybe this has described some of you. Maybe it's described you at the end of your strength, longing for God to come and to comfort you. And verse two, it continues in that same vein. Building on the imagery of this thirsting deer, he says that his soul thirsts for God, and more specifically, for the living God. That's the, the God who lives. 
And it's a statement of his faith. In that moment, God seemed distant, but he knows that God lives. I think we can all relate to that. At times, we look around, and our flesh, which sees only the circumstances, it can cry out, all is lost. We feel powerless, powerless to change anything, but faith looks beyond circumstances, and it appeals to the living God. You can think of Job in his intense trials, yet in our trials, just like Job, we can say, I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. And the psalmist then, he, he asks a question that's revealing. He asks, when shall I come and appear before God? And we can stop here for just a second and ask, well, what's the problem? Couldn't he just pray? And the answer is, of course, yes. And he knew that. He's actually offering the words of this psalm as a prayer that he's addressing to God. But there's still something missing that he's longing for. Like a deer that in its desperation longs for water, so the psalmist longs to come to God. You see that he's talking about going to a place. And so what burdens his soul is the fact that he's been kept from God's house and from God's people. He longs to be in the house of the Lord with the saints. And we know Old Testament worship, it looks somewhat different than all of us sitting here today, right? Their conception of where they were to seek God, it was more localized. They were to come to him as he dwelt among them. This was, of course, tied to the sacrificial system, to ceremony of priests, of offerings. You had the tabernacle and then later the temple. And yes, God's people, they still prayed. We see the psalmist, he, he knows that he can pray. That's what our psalm is after all, but he's feeling the distance. He longs to be in the house of the Lord, but he cannot. And it burdens his soul to feel distant from God. Have you known that pain? It could be something as simple as being physically kept from the church. But I recognize that at times it can occur even while you're sitting here in the pew, feeling misunderstood, so desperately alone. Well, for the longing, and for the lonely soul, this psalm offers hope. In verse 3, we're given insight into the depth of the psalmist's sorrow. He's so deeply depressed by the circumstances that keep him from God's house that tears flow from his eyes day and night. From that we can gather, this is, it's not just a short trial. He's been in the middle of it for a while. He's grappling with a question in his soul. Where is God? And as we learn in verse 3, he's surrounded by these enemies who never grow tired of mockingly asking him that exact same question. They say continually, where is your God? And so he's feeling it. His enemies, they're actually saying it. But does that give him the grounds to believe it? You see, the psalmist, he, he either needs to give in or to hold fast. And in verse 4, we see him driven to remember. He looks back to his past. So even as his tears are falling, his enemies are taunting, he has not forgotten the faithfulness of the Lord. In contrast to his sorrow, he remembers the shouts and the songs of praise of the multitude as they had a feast before the Lord. He remembers a better day. It's a day that gives him fresh courage to pray with all the more longing after God. Perhaps you can relate to the psalmist's sorrow. He looked around, the situation appeared hopeless. Does anyone understand him? We've already noted his tears. It's not a sign of weakness. Sometimes you, you hear that in men, in particular men, you should never cry, that's ridiculous. Here we have a godly man who's letting his tears fall. For all of us, there is a time to weep. 
And in many ways, these tears are themselves a prayer of sorrow and pleading that are poured out from his soul. As the psalmist, he's wrestling for words. His tears reveal his soul with a clarity that words often fail to express. So can tears be a prayer? Well, when they're directed to God, yes. Because we know that God fully understands his heart here as he understands our own. There are seasons where this might be your experience, where it seems that all you can pray are tears. Beloved Christian, in the brokenness of a post-fall world, post-fallen world, your tears may fall. You can remember Jesus himself, the graveside of his friend Lazarus, he, he wept over the brokenness of this world and the sorrow that marked every human life. But even as our tears fall, we can take to heart the words of Psalm 56, verse 8. And there we have David, and he beautifully captures the sense of the compassion of our God. And David, he says, You have kept count of my tossings, put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? And so, beloved of Christ, in this life, there can be so many reasons for our tears to fall but not one tear drops to the ground unnoticed. Scripture says it, but does that reality comfort you? We take our sorrow to the great comforter. 1 Peter 5, verse 7, it tells us, cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. It's not an empty command. It's a promise. You may cast your anxieties on him because God does care for you. And so when you wonder where God is in your hardship or why God has brought a certain trial into your life, you need to bring to mind God's character. Charles Spurgeon, he has a beautiful quote. He grapples with that tension. He says this, God is too good to be unkind, and he's too wise to be mistaken. And when we cannot trace his hand We must trust his heart. That is, we go back to what we know. We go back to his unchanging character. Like the psalmist, you too, you can look back on your life and you can remember. You can see his kindness. You can see his faithfulness. And so even in the face of trial, with a heart brimming over with questions, can you trust that this God will work all things for good? We need to remember, God does not afflict his children with hardship needlessly. He has no delight in the suffering of his people. We may not know why. We may not even like it one bit when we're in the middle of it, but God has a reason, even if we don't see it. After all, what we see around us, it's not everything that we're living for. We don't get all the answers. We know this world is not our home. And so trials, they teach us to loosen our grip, just to let go. They reveal our idols. They reveal our pride. They show us that we need a Savior. And that brings us then to our second point, a saint's self-counsel. Recalling the sweetness of worship in those prior days, the psalmist, he's now going to address his own soul. In verse 5, we're introduced to a refrain that will come back once again at the end of our psalm. It's at the center of our psalm. It serves as this instructive interlude to break up the sorrow of his reflection. And so he turns to his inner man. It's like he has two voices in his head. Here we have faith, coming into question flesh. And in his flesh, he's tempted to despair. But in faith, he's going to call himself to account. He says, why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? And you can almost hear that hysteric answer of the flesh. Why? Why? Look around. Shouldn't it be obvious 
There's a hymn that puts it really well. It says, he has fightings and fears within and without. But faith is the one who's asking the question. And he's not looking for excuses. The only solution to his depression won't be found in in conjuring up some hidden inner strength. Just dig deep and and find that, that help. No, it's in looking in hope to God. So see what he says. He says, hope in God. For I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. He looks beyond the hardship, and he sees that even in the midst of it, his salvation still belongs to God. That God is his God. And that truth, it speaks to his trembling heart. And so let's take a moment here. Because after such a confession, you see, he just nailed it. We might expect that the clouds, they would just clear away. The tension would lift immediately. That the rest of our psalm, it would just be a triumph as the psalmist reflects on how God delivered him. But that's it's not what happens. It's not what happens. By giving himself this counsel to look to God, he did the right thing. Yet it seems relief was not instantly found. And how often is this not true of us as well. Unanswered questions, tears poured out, a trial that never seems to end, and we cry out, but heaven just seems as unmovable as concrete. Do we have grounds to then give up? Is there ever a time where a Christian can give up? And if we learn the instruction of our psalm, the answer is, of course not. In your own season of hardship, Do you feel tempted to question God's love? Well, like the psalmist, let faith speak. Turn to the word. Look up passages. Passages like Romans 8. I encourage you, read it aloud. Take it on your lips. Scripture, it speaks to the questions of the saints. There are answers. I mentioned Romans 8, it's a balm for the believer's soul. If we can look at verse 28, it says, and we know that the, for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose, and notice the all things, everything that includes your most heart-rending trial. And yet, if we know ourselves, we know only too well how easy it is for us to doubt, or to forget. Well, Paul, he goes on in Romans 8. He's not done. He asks, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? And we know the answer. In Christ, nothing shall separate us from the love of God. So whatever the trial whether it's cancer, whether it's, it's loneliness, maybe clinical depression, maybe sorrow, financial loss, enemies, anything else that you could imagine. The answer, it's the same. You need to turn to your hope. Well, who is that? Who is your hope? It's Jesus Christ, who fully understands, who is the only hope for a dying world. Becoming a Christian, it doesn't mean that you'll never have a single hardship again. Far from it. We know from experience that sometimes it's through the hardest terrain that God brings his beloved children along. But see that he is still the one who brings them. And he does so to bring us nearer to our hope. So then our third point, Let's look in verses 6 to 10 at a saint's confidence. In verse 6, we're entering another cycle. His self-counsel, his confession of reliance upon God in the face of sorrow, it's been declared, and he once more returns to his prayer. And he covers similar ground as before. You can see that his soul, it's still cast down. But it's the sadness of his soul that actually drives him to seek out the protective and the loving arms of God. 
It's because he's downcast that all the more he remembers God. He's moved to look to his hope, and we must do the same. And it's in verse 6 that we get an insight into the psalmist's location. He says, therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon, from Mount Miser. This is likely where he's writing this psalm from. And it helps explain the psalmist's inability to go up to God's house. His enemies, they've confined him or restrained him to the mountainous region that was north of Israel. That's where you'll find these mountains. This mountain range, it's called Hermon. It's the place where the Jordan River begins. It's fed by the streams that flow down from the mountains. Now, Mount Miser, it's actually unknown to us. And that's perfectly okay. But it's likely a a more precise place to pinpoint exactly where he was. And we can remember something here. The Psalms, they're not all written in king's palaces. They were not all written in the temple. This is real life. This is real anguish. These are real people. And we need to read the Psalms in that way. In verse 7, the psalmist, he reaches for an illustration to help him explain to God the extent of his sorrow and the depression of his soul. And again, the imagery that he draws upon, it's powerful. He says, deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls. In the Hebrew mind, the concept of deep is often tied to deep water, conveyed a sense of overwhelming power, chaos, mystery. So he's expressing his absolute smallness, his frailty in the face of what feels like this immense trial. It's possible that from where he was, the psalmist, he could see those mountain streams, which at certain times of year would have brought down the water to the Jordan and would have come down with great force. And so he pictures these multiple streams calling out. He, he gives them a voice. He says they're, they're roaring in their ferocities. Gravity is just speeding them onwards. They come down in a powerful waterfall. Now, if you've been to Niagara Falls, you can perhaps picture the imagery that the psalmist intends. And if we're fair, a little more than he intends. Palestine, they do not have Niagara Falls. But I want you to put yourself there at Niagara Falls. Can you hear the roar? Can you feel the spray? Can you sense the power? There's a danger. There's a power there. There are guardrails there for a reason. And so hypothetically, and I mean it purely hypothetically, if you were able to stand directly under those falls as that water just is coming crashing down, crashing down, how long do you think you could stand there? And the strongest guy here, it's not going to be long. You begin to, to sense the powerlessness that the psalmist is intending. But he goes further than that. It's from the power of the waterfall, he shifts to the position of a man who's out there upon the sea. And the sea, it rolls. And the breakers, they crash. And the waves, they are rising. And they're rising again. And they're not simply passing him by. He feels as if he's being buffeted again and again. And you can picture it. Just that little bobbing speck far out there on a raging stormy sea. He's drowning. He's desperate. Unless God hears his cry, he is going to drown. Breakers and waves have gone over me. What sorrow are we talking about here? He looks at his circumstances. He feels that he has been utterly overwhelmed. But we need to see that in this illustration, his faith is still speaking loudly. Look to your text. Whose waterfalls, whose breakers, whose waves have gone over him? We see his words, your waterfalls your breakers, your waves. And so while he feels pummeled from hardship after hardship, he doesn't see this as blind coincidence or uncaring fate. He sees that it's God's hand that are behind these events. 
And in our own sorrows, of course, so must we. In almost all of our lives, there will be seasons where the psalmist's cry, it it describes our own. It describes our our sobbing prayer. Lord, this time, it's just too much. It's, It's over my head. I can't do this anymore. Our heads, they they feel like they're submerged. We we feel like we are that drowning man. And we may wonder, why? Why this hardship? Why me? Why now? Or maybe even, why to the person that I love? In our hearts, they cry out. Our eyes, they turn upward. And our trust is yet in him. So see where this leaves the psalmist. While he struggles with the difficulty of being among enemies, he's far from God's house, he recognizes that it is God who is still in control. And can you imagine if we had to go through life thinking that everything that happened was blind chance or coincidence? Brothers and sisters, many of your neighbors, many of your friends, maybe even some of your family, live in that exact way. A hopeless, empty empty universe. But we know that it is not so. These are God's waterfalls. These are God's waves. These are God's billows. Because God is the one who reigns over everything. And in verse 3, we saw that the psalmist's tears, they were his food day and night. But in verse 8, we see his confidence. To match his tears, he has the steadfast love of the Lord in the day. He has a song of faith in the night. Even as his tears fall, his faith is fixed on the steadfast love of the Lord. Even as he's floundering about like this drowning swimmer, feeling like God isn't seeing this, he knows better. And faith combats what he sees around him. And so he continues his prayer to the Lord who gives him life. The Lord who in our own sustains us, even in our sorrow and questioning. Verse 9, he's addressing God again. But even before he lets his questions drop from his lips, his faith, he holds up God as his rock. Yes, here's a man who has very heavy questions. Here's a man who's grappling, but he's grappling from a place of faith. Do you see his first question? He asks, why have you forgotten me? To ask this of the Lord, why? But is it true? It may have felt like it, and it may feel like that for us at times. But had God forgotten Can God forget his beloved children? No. And the psalmist, he knows it. But it's the agony of his soul rising to express honestly what he feels. But we need to see that even in this question, there are gospel implications for all of us. Even when we wrestle with this question, Lord, why have you forgotten me? We can hear echoes of our Savior from the cross. Now on the cross of Calvary, when even the sun, it failed to shine upon him, forsaken by man, forsaken by God, a cry, it breaks through from our Savior's lips, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And it's the only time in history where those words have risen on a child of God's lips and been fully true. But why? Did our Savior, our beloved Savior, cry out in his forsakenness? Well, he cried out with that cry for you and for me, for the psalmist, for all the sons and daughters who would ever be united to him in faith. Beloved, we see that that Christ, he drank the full cup of God's wrath to the very dregs, nothing remaining. That cup should have been ours. And he drank it all so that even when we are in those waves, when we are in the waterfalls, when our hearts are breaking and we're crying out to God, we are never alone. Christians, you need to hold on to this. 
Christ came to be forsaken so that you would never be forgotten. He is your hope. Jesus Christ, the sacrificial lamb of God, bearing the just wrath of God against your sin completely, and then joyfully giving you his perfect righteousness as your own, as if you had done it yourself. And more than that, he won't ever lose us. Conversion, it's not, it's the beginning. It's, it's not the end. Our Savior, he says, behold, I am with you always to the very end of the age. Our only hope is found in the person of Jesus Christ. As Christians, our everything comes back to Jesus. And so I ask you, brothers and sisters, no matter the trial, where are you turning today? Where are you turning? Is it to Christ? Do you know this hope? And the psalm, it's, it's almost over. It's not yet. Even buoyed by his faith, the psalmist, he still has these searching questions. This is important. Having questions does not mean that you lack faith. Christians may ask why, but it's where you go with those questions that matters. You may bring your every question to the very one who loved you so much that he was willing to die for you. Verse 10, he compares the taunts of his enemies to the breaking of his bones. They're mocking him, but in doing so, they're mocking God. And because he loves God with such an insatiable love, he feels the mockery as if it's crushing his bones. But it all leads him back to his hope once again. The more unanswered questions that he has, the more he leans into his hope. And so finally, and very briefly, we come to verse 11 in our last point, a saint's comfort. If you look at verse 11, it's ground we've covered, should be familiar, comes verse five again. And so having capped off that first cycle by appealing to self-counsel, he does so again after the second half of our psalm. Having poured out his soul in prayer, he's expressed his pain in vivid imagery again. He once more returns to his words of self-counsel. He ends up at the same place because it's the only place where a child of God can properly end up. Where else would you go? He comes back to his hope. We see in this that there are times where we will need to walk that same circuitous route more than once. That if we come to the end of a prayer and we still feel cold, like we haven't been heard, we can begin again. That the best thing that we could do is to come again, come once more. We may once more pour out our soul before the Lord in earnest prayer because God does hear. God does care. And so let us learn from the psalmist. Let's take his comfort as our own. Come what may, he knew where his hope lay. He would not be dissuaded from his longing after God. And just like this psalmist, when this, those waves, they seem to be going over us, when culture slips into absurdity, and being a Christian becomes grounds for mockery, like the psalmist, we have unshakable ground. We have something to hold on to. We have hope. We have Jesus Christ, our Lord. And by extension, all the promises that are bound up in him for those who believe. He has brought us our salvation. He preserves us to our last breath. And so we see that this is a hope that is guaranteed. It's signed with the blood of Christ. It's sealed in his resurrection. Do you see the Savior that you have? Where else would you go? Congregation, I don't know you. This is my first time here. I'm not going to pretend to walk in here and know all of your particular waterfalls, your waves, and your billows. It wouldn't be honest. But know this. 
by the grace of God, I can tell you where to go when you feel that you are among them. Because there is only one place. You may come to your Savior. You may pour out your heart. For not a tear drops to the ground unnoticed. Not a prayer goes unheard. And with the psalmist, we may say with confidence, I shall again praise him. Dear brothers and sisters, in this life, I can guarantee you that trials will come. But remember Jesus Christ, your Savior, your very life, he who was forsaken so that you would never be forgotten. Remember him. Remember your hope. Amen. Let us pray. Oh Lord, you know each individual who is here today. You know your people. You know their suffering and their sorrows. You know their tears and their sadness. It is not lost on you. We plead your own promises that we may come, we may cast our anxieties upon you, for you care for us. And so, Lord, as we are here today, make that the cry of our heart, that we would, would long to come to our hope, that we would long to live in the light of this hope, that Jesus Christ would be altogether lovely in our eyes, and that we would go to him, and that we, we would know that we will find a reception, that he has loved us, and he loves us still, now and to the end of time. O oh Lord, increase our love, increase our faith, that we may look past our circumstances and see that you, our God, reign in heaven and that we have hope. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our song of response is number 459, and I would ask that you would stand as we sing it.
Congregation, receive the benediction afterwards. We'll sing number 567. So as you go into your week, remember your hope. The benediction comes from Romans chapter 15, verse 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Amen. Thank mm-hmm. you.